Hello, participants of the Lead Your Team to Greatness Masterclass. I'm so happy we're all here to have this important conversation. One of my favorite quotes in the whole world is the quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I've always got inspired by that quote in my work of coaching teams and helping leaders to lead their teams. Because our work as team leaders is probably the one thing that will have the biggest impact in our careers. How can we lead our teams to greatness? So as you're coming on to the live, let me know if you can hear me because I, I can see a comment. Has it started yet? And let me know what is greatness for you, for your team? How would you know you have led your team to greatness? What, what's your vision? What's your idea? And if you don't want to answer that, what's greatness for your team? Maybe your intention. What would you like to get out of this four days masterclass? We're going to have an amazing conversation about leading teams to greatness. So it will be great if you start commenting. I can see the comments. Um, what's your intention for this masterclass? Or what's greatness for you? Where do you want to lead your teams? How would you know you have led your teams to greatness? For those of you who have never come in life before, who haven't, um, you're not familiar from my work with my work, I'm Katarina Costugla, I'm an executive and team coach. We can hear you, yes, thank you. And I am the author of the whole Successful Meetings book from Penguin uh, Business Expert Series. And before I launched my coaching company, The Leader Path, I spent more than eight years at Google as a business leader. And I'm so excited. These four days, I'll share so much knowledge and tips and some stories with you in order to help you. Uh, lead your team to greatness. So I have my first answer. Greatness equals vision, complementarity, accountability, solidarity. That's fantastic. So keep them coming. So the topic for today's session is how can you define the goal or define the problem with your team? And this could be from defining the team's purpose to defining what you're going to do today, to defining what you're going to do in this project, to defining what you're going to do this year. What is the team solving for? And how you can be really good at getting to that. This is what we're going to talk today. And in the next four days, it's my framework. Define the problem is today. Develop ideas tomorrow. Decide how to make decisions with your team is on uh, Wednesday and do how to inspire action, how to plan for action is the fourth master uh, masterclass. Uh, okay, so no audio, video is frozen. Is it the same for all of you? If you can comment, if you can still hear me, that would be great. Otherwise, I will need to do something with my Wi-Fi. Um, let's see. I am waiting for someone to comment. Okay, maybe video is frozen then. If you cannot hear me. Um, okay. Happy to be here. We have, let's see, do we have a technical issue here? Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> there is some delay. I got, I got the comments. They, yes, you can hear me. Perfect. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for participating. Let me start with how to define your team's purpose. And I got my best tip about how to do that from Peter Hawkins when I interviewed him from, for his book. He's a thought leader and author. And he told me the team's purpose needs to be outward and inward and future backwards. What does this mean? You will ask, and what team purpose is, why does the team exist? Who are we here to serve? Why do we exist as a team in the first place? 
And the questions when you're defining the team's purpose is, what do our stakeholders need from us, the people we're here to serve? And also, what does the future need from us? So starting with purpose, more like engaging with our environment and the future outward in, future backwards. In terms of defining the problem, and I know for some of you, problem might not be the right word. You can replace it with opportunity, defining the challenge, defining the goal. I, I use the, the word problem, use the word you, it works for you. How do we define what we need to solve for as a team? And there are three steps that I recommend. First, create a shared view of reality. Second step, define what success looks like. And third step, create a problem statement. And I will share with you some tips and some techniques of how to, you, to do each one of these steps in order to define the problem. Because the number one issue I've seen when I've observed teams working together is they, they jump this step. They go into solutions. They think the, the sooner they will start working on a project, the sooner the project will be finished. And all of this are assumptions that make us jump the most important element in all our teamwork, which is what's the real problem here? What are, what are we supposed to, to solve for? So that's why we're starting day number one. We're starting with the most important step how can we define the problem correctly? Because once we define the problem correctly, the solutions have become a lot easier and obvious and the projects become a lot easier to deliver and the work becomes more impactful. Okay, let's start with step number one. Create a shared view of reality. Why is this important? You would be surprised how many times we have different opinions about what is going on now. Reality is what is going on now. And the team members have different opinions. And I, I was working with a team recently. They even had gotten data from their feedback survey from the employees. So you would expect that they all had the same results. They had read the feedback from the employees. They had a shared view of reality. Usually data helps uh, create the shared view of reality. But when we started working together, I realized they had no agreement about what this data meant because one of the executives had looked at the numerical satisfaction rate, which was pretty good, and the other executive had looked at the verbatim statements where people had shared some complaints. So they came into the meeting, someone thinking, oh, goodness, our employees are so happy with us and with the company. And the other executive was, oh, my goodness, the employees are so frustrated with us. Having read the same report. Why is also having the same view of reality so tricky? And there is one bias that's called the hidden profiles bias. I don't know if you heard of this before. I, I hadn't. I have to say all my executive and business careers, I didn't know about the hidden profiles bias. And I was really interested and intrigued when I learned what it was. So the hidden profiles bias is that people in a team will not talk about things that they, they only know themselves. People in a team will tend to talk about things that everybody knows. And you can see why this is problematic. So you're the leader, you're leading a meeting, you think everybody's sharing what they know, their unique information, but people will not do that, most likely. It's very rare that they will overcome the hidden profiles bias to share information that is unique to them. And what happens is we don't have all the information on the table a lot of the times. We don't have a shared view of reality. And I don't know why people don't share it. Maybe they don't, it's uncomfortable bringing new information on the table. It's always easier to talk about something that everybody knows and agrees. Probably that's that. But knowing this bias is very useful for a leader. So how can you create a shared view of reality before you start talking about the future, before you start talking about the work? The most easy 
way to do that is ask questions. Start your meeting with what's working right now, what's not working, what have we tried so far, what do you want to say about this topic, what do you want to hear about this topic. What's also interesting here when we're creating a shared view of reality is that many, many times it's not just the perspectives of the people in the team that we need to invite in order to define what's going on. Most of the times, because we don't operate in asylum, we need to invite perspectives from people outside the team. And by the way, feel free to ask me questions as I go along. I'm happy to ha make this interactive and have a conversation. So what do I mean by outside perspectives? When we are talking about the topic, we need to know what, do, what does the customer think about this? What do the employees think about this? What do the investors think about this? Whatever that is, usually we're not operating in a silo and we need outside perspectives. So it's also important after you've invited the perspectives of the team, you ask for the outside perspectives and not necessarily, you don't have to invite people. Sometimes it, it might be worth inviting a customer or an employee or an investor in your meeting, but just framing the conversation. What do the employees think about this? What do the clients think about this? Uh, when we coach people live, the way we do that, we have an empty chair there. And we say, this is, for example, the customer's chair. And we ask people to sit on the chair and share the perspective of the customer. When I've done this virtually, I have asked people to change in their Zoom. Um, I have asked them to change in their Zoom their title for example, to investor or employee. I have a comment that the feed cut off, so let me know if it's still cut off. It looks like we are having some connections issues today, but I'm really keen on getting all this knowledge out to you. So let me know if the feed is cut off still. Okay, I like the point that people stick to what they are comfortable. Working on framing the conversation helps to get what needs to be shared. Yes, that's a fantastic point. Um, an example I had in one of my coaching sessions was there was a VP of design and I asked her if anyone needs to bring some outside perspectives, you can change your Zoom um, title. So she changed to designer and she shared an emotional a statement about how her designers felt about um he said I, myself as a designer i feel frustrated that i cannot get into the roadmap fix and this is frustrating by her changing making clear that she's bringing a perspective for, of someone else which was her teams helped make it less personal for the other team members to accept that view because a lot of times you'll, you'll notice you'll be in a team and you'll be representing someone else, but you forget to mention it, that you're bringing your team's perspective or your client's perspective or the investor's perspective or whatever. So that's another tip I want to give you. Make sure you bring outside perspectives, but also make it very explicit. Fantastic. So the other way, there are many more ways to create a shared view of realities. And I love using, for example, constellations. Constellations is having people vote with their feet. For example, I have asked the team, put a, the word innovation in the center, sit closer to the word innovation. If you think you're an innovative team, sit further away, holding the mirror, really reflecting what the team is saying. That's another way to create a shared view of reality. Once you've done that and you've brought everyone on the same page, where are we now? What's working? What's not working? What's going on? The second step is define what success looks like. And I've done this experiment again and again, and other people have done this experiment. It's really rare to find a team that everyone has the same view of what success looks like. Again, I was interviewing another team coach for my book, Georgina Woodstra, and she said she had a team draw what success looked like for the project at hand. And one person drew the team getting an award. And the other person drew the team skiing in a ski slope, celebrating the success of the project. And the third person drew dollar sign and signs and Excel spreadsheets. 
And that's okay. By doing this exercise, really understanding what success meant to all of them, they avoided conflict down the line because they could support each other, achieve their goals. They would help each other make money and awards. And then once the project was done, they all booked a skiing trip to celebrate. So how can you define what success looks like? There are two ways you can do that. That's, there's the top-down approach. That's when you have a very clear vision. And there's the bottom-up. When you don't have a clear vision, but you want the whole team to come together with the vision. Again, this could be for the whole company. This could be for the project. This could be for the specific task at hand. Getting some alignment. What does success look like here for us? If you're doing it top down, it's important. And I do recommend this. If you do have a strong vision, do not pretend you don't. I've coached leaders on this. Um, if you have a strong vision, share it with your team. But then give them the opportunity. Even you can ask them to go in breakouts to, to challenge it and add things or subtract things or, or influence the vision. But do share it if you have it. And if you are to do it bottom up, have the individuals think what their vision is. And here I will say two tips for you. Focus on the what, not the how, for now. That's another mistake many of us do when we're thinking what success looks like. We, um, we just don't think about things we don't believe it's possible to achieve. We're thinking on the how, how are we going to find the budget for this? When you're thinking in the, for the vision, what success looks like, focus on what you want. How would we know we were successful? If everything goes in the best possible way for this project, how would it look like? And don't focus on the how. Because once you have a clear vision, a lot of ideas that you cannot predict right now will come, right? And try to make the vision tangible. If you're working on a bottom-up approach and you're asking your team to come up with individual visions, and then you need to find the similarities and, and bridge it to a common vision for the team, I do recommend you use more visuals. Maybe they can draw, maybe they can do a model with Lego, maybe... Uh, wh whatever that is, because then when you're debating the visions, it's less personal. You can say, I like this about this vision and this about the other one, rather than I agree with John, I disagree with Mary, making it personal. Try to make the visions more visual and tangible so you can actually do the work to bring it them together. Let me see if we have any comments or questions here. Inviting perspectives can be easier if you also step outside of your comfort zone in front of your employees. Absolutely. All right, fantastic. We have, thank you for all confirming that the feed is okay. I think it, it's important. Now we will go to the third step, which is to form a problem statement. And it's nice if the problem statement starts with three words, how might we? And the how might we, you might be familiar with this word construct if you're into design thinking. It started in the 70s with Procter & Gamble and it got popularized by the company IDEO. This is how they frame their problems. How might we do X? The more specific, the better. And I love the how might we because it frames the problem as an opportunity. It's almost irresistible not to start solving for this, right? How might we increase all our sales in this sector by 10%? Like, I want to start brainstorming or ideating on this, right? Okay. Let me, again, most of the meetings and most of the teams I have observed, they I get this wrong. They jump that step or they solve for the wrong problem. And I was observing a meeting of an agency team and it was a very well facilitated meeting. And their topic is how they, they wanted to make their pitching for new accounts uh, better. They wanted to improve their pitching process, their pitches. So they had a great facilitator and he started with 
this sharing, the, creating the sa same view of reality, what's working right now in the pitches, in the pitches, what's not working. And what came out of that was there were too many people in the teams working on the pitch and there were, the executives would change direction in the pitch uh, late. And then there was a lot of wasted work and frustration. And there was a great work on, of unearthing what's going on right now. But then what happened when they moved to form a problem statement, the problem statement they formed was how might we go make our pitches great again, which was a very generic problem statement. The team ideated, created a lot of ideas, and then they voted on the winning idea. And the winning idea was create a police investigation board, you know, the ones with the threads and the pins like on a board, which was a great idea to create a big picture of how the pitch was going. But it was not solving anything of what was going on that happened that came on in the sharing um, the reality process. It wasn't solving why executives were changing last minute the direction of the pitch. So what we did is we used the technique of the five whys. And you must have heard about this technique. And but I, I want to illustrate it in this story of how it works. Okay, so we're unhappy with the pitches. Why? Because executives come last minute and they change the direction of the pitch and all of this work goes wasted. Why do executives come last minute in the pitching process, in the pitching preparation, and they change the direction? Because the executives are, can miss the first meetings because they are in the different pitching meetings. Why is that? Because its executive is sponsoring a lot of pitches. Why is that? Because the company goes after too many pitches. So after we did the five wise technique, the problem became a lot more defined. The problem now was how can we go after fewer pitches that were actually more likely to win? You see how interesting that process is and how defining the problem can be so much more, um, can save so much time if we spend the time to define the problem correctly. I hear some feedback here that you like that I don't have any slides, I like it too. Feel free to, to comment and ask questions. I'll give you uh, how many, there are many techniques of how you define the problem. I think I'll give you one more. Um, look for the exceptions. Where the, is the problem not present. So again, let me give you an example. I was coaching um, a global leader. He was leading a global community with some global counterparts and some local counterparts, a global transformation project. And he came with the problem of the local counterparts were not committed to the transformation. They were not committed to the community. And that was a big deal, a big issue. We know as coaches and as leader, usually the, the problem that comes is not the real problem. So we started investigating. And the question I asked is, is this the case with all the local counterparts? Are they all not committed? Where's the exception to this problem? And he figured out some of the counterparts were committed. And wh what was going on there? Like identifying where are things working well and what's going on there. And he realized that when things were working well, the local counterpart had a good, strong one-to-one -one relationship with the global counterpart. That was a key aha moment, a key insight. So we define the problem now. How can I facilitate better one-to-one -one relationships with the local and, and global counterparts? So looking for the exceptions, five wise technique, and many more. Looking at the problem with different angles, inviting uh, outside perspectives. Once you have defined the problem, what is the team going to work on solving? What's also interesting is to test the commitment of the group. Is the group committed to solving that problem? Okay, you've discussed what's going on, you shared what you'd like to happen as a success, you defined the problem before you move into ideation, which we're going to cover tomorrow check the commitment of the group. Do we want to solve this problem? From one to 10, how important is this problem? 
how urgent is this problem? Who will benefit from us solving it? If you're sensing a low commitment, maybe you want to ask, what is the cost of inaction? Because solving problems is not easy. Like it's, it's very obvious to us that we need to invest resources and time and energy to solve a problem. So the cost of solving a problem is very obvious. The cost of not solving a problem is not that obvious. You need as a leader to ask the question, what is the cost of inaction? What is the cost if we do, don't do anything? Where will we be in one year's time? And maybe you'll realize that actually the, the group is not committed anyway. So focus on a more important problem. There's not a lack of problems. Or by this, you kind of solidify the commitment of the, of the team to solving this problem. And then you're more likely for the team to do the work and succeed later. All right, let me summarize the process and the insights we covered today. Define your team's purpose. Why does the team exist? Who are you here to, sell, to serve? What does the future need from the team? What do the people you're serving need from this team? And this is important because we all know we're motivated by why and meaning and don't let's not skip defining the team's purpose, which by the way, is different than the team's vision. The team's purpose is why do we exist? For example, the Leader Path team, we're here coaching pioneer, pioneering leaders for impact and fulfillment through better clarity and leadership. That's the mission, that's the purpose. Why do we exist in the world? The vision can be how many team members do we want to have in one year's time? How many clients? How will our product look? It's a different thing. The second, there are three steps to defining the problem, the opportunity, the challenge, what the team needs to work on. Create a shared view of reality. Bear in mind the hidden profile bias. Invite perspectives. Define what success looks like for the team. Create some awareness it can be different from everyone you may need to bring some alignment steve Jobs said it's okay if we're fighting of what's the best way to get to san francisco but what happens most of the time is that some of us want to go to san francisco and some people secretly want to go to santiago this might be happening in your team make sure you bring that to the light and you work on the different sometimes conflicting destinations visions the team members might have of what success looks like. And then create a problem statement. How might we, by, by looking at exceptions, looking at the five whys, going deeper, what's the real problem here? Let's define it properly. Okay. I think now is the time to, to ask any questions. I will share a little bit with you, uh, with you about tomorrow. Tomorrow is all about how to make the team innovative, how to make the team creative. If you're one of the people that you feel, oh, why do all the ideas come, have to come from me? I need the team to generate more ideas. I need more innovation, more creativity. And brainstorming doesn't work, by the way. Most of the times I'm going to talk to you about what works instead. So this is tomorrow's session. And I hope to see you there. Feel free to post any questions. This was the piece I wanted to share with you today. And now I'm going to, to move on to talk to you about um, a couple of programs with the Leader Path. If you feel complete today and you don't have any questions, I will see you tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to continue this conversation. If you'd like to hear a couple of programs we, we have coming and we have available, I will stay um, and share this with you for a few minutes and, and then I'll answer the questions. So. The first thing I wanted to, to share, if you do want to go deeper in these topics, hold successful meetings, is from five pounds, I think, in the UK for the Kindle to about 15, 20 pounds. It is, don't be misled by the title. It is around the whole aspects of leadership. That's the feedback of the book around, we just share a tiny piece. I think for creating the problem definition, I have six techniques in the book, and that's just one chapter out of 15 chapters of the book. So hold successful meetings if you want to go deeper on this. If you would like, if you are not a big reader, there is also a course 
the whole successful meetings course. I partner with an instructional designer from Harvard to, to create an, a very uh, interactive and short course. I really wanted to capture the most practical techniques and tips uh, for for the chapters of the book. And I partnered with a Harvard with a person that had worked for Harvard instructional design, and we created the whole successful meetings course. It's two to two uh, plus VAT. And it has a lot of bonus material as well, 25 scripts of what to say, my interviews that I did for the book. So if you, it's up to you. If you like watching videos and the interactive element and the bonus material, the course will be great. If, you love, if you're a reader, I would say hold successful meetings, uh, the book. One more thing I wanted to share with you. Let me actually add the banners. Uh, this is the hold successful meetings. We are doing... I'm doing, I'm facilitating a two hour workshop on the 6th of January. So if you would like to set up for an epic 2022, set up the intentions, you will have a workbook and we'll spend two hours together setting up and, and ideating for how to make 2022 epic. That's just 55 pounds plus VAT. It's new year, new frontier workshop. So let me see now and take some questions. What if the team is not committed and management decide to continue in this direction? Let me, let me take this question. So that's a problem, obviously. So what I would say is have a discussion. Why is the team not committed? They might disagree. And that usually doesn't happen on the problem. This usually happens on the solution, which we're going to talk in the fourth day, which is around the do. What happens when we decide to do something and people disagree, right? Um, usually the lack of commitment comes when it comes to action. Um, if the team is not committed that the problem is important enough, again, I would say listen the team out. Because people are a lot more likely to to commit even if they disagree, if they felt they were heard. A lot of the times they don't feel heard and they will go in the corridors or in the chats and talk about behind our backs. Bring all the dissenting views in your meeting, make them obvious, listen to the team. And then the best thing I've had, you can try to influence them. And then again, we're gonna talk about in day four, how to inspire action and influence the team. But in the end of the day, people will disagree with the course of action you're going to take or the problem or the strategy or the problems you decide to solve. And in that moment, you may stop seeking for agreement or consensus, but you need to, uh, to seek for commitment. So Jeff Bezos disagree and commit. Are you going to commit to this? I heard you. This is how we're going forward. If you are the decision maker, can you commit to this? This is what I will say. I will stop seeking agreement. I will start talking about commitment. And people will not want to sabotage the business. And if they do, it's a different conversation. I hope this asks, answers the questions, Claire. Feel free to, to say a follow-up. What if there's a difference in the mandate from senior management versus team's vision, shared reality? I love that question. Let's say, I assume you are the leader. So you are the member of the man senior management team. There's always a leader who is a member of both teams, the team you lead and the team you're a member of. I will repeat what I said to Claire. When you are a member of the senior management team, do whatever you can to influence their decision, to bring the perspective of your team, bring data, bring, bring your disagreement. Try to influence before the decision is made. Once the decision has been made and you've done all you could to influence it, usually the best way forward is to commit to it. Because if you don't commit to it, if you go to your team and say, I don't agree with this, but this is what the senior management said, you're sabotaging the decision and it's unlikely to succeed and you're sabotaging the business. So 
disagree, influence, try to change people's minds. Once the decision is made, usually the best way forward is to commit. I hope that answers the question. Let's see. If the team is not committed, change team. I would say, I ask, try to figure it out. I think a lot of times we're very judgmental when we don't understand something. We get judgmental instead of curious. If the team is not committed, what's going on? Try to be curious. What's going on? How is their perspective so different from my perspective? Let me see if I'm missing something. Going in with the assumption, I might be missing a piece of information here because what I'm seeing doesn't make sense. So my assumption is not they're incompetent or they're low IQ or they don't know what they're doing. My assumption is I'm missing a piece of information. Let me discuss. Let me figure out what's going on. And most of the times, if we go like that, we, we realize there's probably a reason why there's such a difference of view going with open-minded. And, and then again, there might be a point that you feel a problem or an opportunity is very important to you and the team is not aligned. And sometimes the right solution for you it is to change teams, whether it is to let people go. I think that's what you mean, change teams. If you're the leader letting people go, if you're a team member, maybe you need to change teams, change companies. Sometimes, if we cannot align on where we're going, if we don't have the same values or we cannot align on where we're going, yes, the best solution could be to part ways. Amicably, with respect, but part ways. Let's see. Um, could you please repeat the three steps of defining the problem? Yes. Create a shared view of reality, define the success, what success looks like, and form a problem statement. And by the way, sometimes you won't use that order. I like that order because it makes sense to me. Where are we now? Where do we want to go? What do we need to solve to get there? Sometimes you might do it a different way. Uh, but what you need to is to, to, def to define a problem statement. <laughs> okay. Let's see another this big question. How can we break mental fixedness in startups about CEO is one who came up with an initial idea, though she may be lacking many attributes of team leader. I think this mental fixedness contribute a lot in startups failure. Yes, I think I, I understand what you're talking about. It if when the CEO came up with idea and he's very attached to his own idea and there is a a lot of escalation and that's I agree with you and I'll give uh, to support um, it's called I think it's a, the sunk cost fallacy uh, in, in day number three when we'll talk about making decision I will talk a little bit about the biases and the fallacies but if you see all the big failures it doesn't even have to be a startup failure it's usually a matter of escalating commitment in a wrong strategy for example, Nokia, they, they kept investing in marketing in their software and their phones. Well, the, the market was starting being dominated by iPhone and Android. So that's, and then they fail. Or the HMV with their, with their stores, with the DVDs, even if people were searching, switching to online, they kept investing in new stores. So there's something there around escalating commitment uh, when we have already invested in one idea and there's something there about it was my idea so I feel more favorable towards that idea so I would say that if you are the leader and we'll talk about this tomorrow it needs to be for creativity to work it needs to be non-hierarchical you may want to hold on on your idea and listen to the ideas of what people what other people can say and be really open that m m other people might have better ideas than you um, and it's not a matter of ego and and then there will be times that you will have a strong vision and then it's the time more to inspire your team to come and support your vision as a, as a founder because what I don't want to do is trying to instill a consensus 
philosophy or type of work in, in the business that Consensus can be great for some decisions, but it can be very slow and exp expensive for other types of decisions. And sometimes as a founder, you will have a very strong vision and it is your job to inspire your team to follow that vision if you really believe that this is the vision. Listen to them, listen to the dissenting views openly, be open that other people will have good ideas or they might be right and you could be wrong, but also it might be that as the founder, you have the strongest vision and you need to bring other people with you. Um, what's your thoughts on positivity intelligence? I'm not aware or PQ. I'm not really aware what you, what, what's that? Joel, if you want to, to elaborate about positivity in intelligence and how it fits with the teams, I'm happy to, to answer. But I haven't heard of PQ the way you mentioned it, so not sure. Okay, I think, do we have any more questions? Okay, fantastic. So if you found value today, I, I, I would invite you, you want to, to share the, the class today. It's going to be up, I think, for limited time, this free masterclasses. I'd love to see you back tomorrow to talk about innovation and creativity and how to get the team really, those creativity juices going and bring some great ideas in your team. And I would love as well to see you in the New Year, New Frontier workshop in January 6th. I have one more question. What about backing up this vision with data as a means of persuasion? Yes. Um, I would say in the creating a shared view of reality, data is extremely helpful. This is where I would put this, the data in, in here, in the, in the step we're doing today, define what the problem is. Data is helpful and it will reduce a lot of unnecessary conflict because a lot of the times if we don't know the data, it, it becomes about personal opinion and can get a per personal conf conflict. And I, I grew up at Google, right? I, it's a very data-driven company. We wouldn't be able to present something unless we had the data to back it up. So I think it's a good, it's definitely good to have data. That said, if you're doing something very, very innovative that nobody has done before, it might be hard to look, to find the data. But then we might look, how can we design some experiments that are small enough that can give us some data, give us some feedback of, is this idea working or not? Perfect. All right, I think we've been uh, live for almost 45 minutes. This was an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for, for your questions. Thank you for so much for this engagement and see you again back tomorrow. Take care.